Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thank you for downloading another episode of the podcast. Our guest today is Nigel Devonish, a former Royal Marine and a member of the Mountain and Arctic Warfare Carder. Nigel served 22 years with the Marines, eight of those in the Carder, and his success of the Brigade Patrol Troop. He was also the last Carder Sergeant Major of the, of the Carder and the first CSM when it became the Brigade Patrol Troop in the early 90s. This is the fifth podcast we recorded about the Falklands War, and we've previously covered three powers battle for Mount London, one for eight and naval gunfire, the Royal Marines Band, and operations by D Squadron 22 SAS. On this episode, we'll be discussing the history of the Carda, their role as a brigade recce troop in the Falklands, and what their success on operations down south meant for the future of their unit. So, Knights, thanks for coming on the podcast. As we do with all our guests, can you start by telling us when you joined up, what made you enlist, and why did you choose the Royal Marines? Well, thanks, gents. Well, I mean, my father was a uh, World War Two generation. He was in the RAF. He never inspired me to join them. I have to say that uh, <laughs> after the, the RAF, like many, he was searching around for a job and fell into the pub trade. And we were always moving around. In fact, I was uh, I was born in Aden. We eventually settled down in Blackheath in London, and my mother was concerned about the, the amount of moves we were doing. And uh, in the pub trade, the licensed vigilants had a uh, a boarding school in Ascot, so I was sent off there, which was great because it gave me stability and you know grasped and excelled at the outdoor sports that you know these schools you know provide. Educationally, I suppose I was adequate. Well, I left at the earliest opportunity. I mean, I, I, I just wasn't that way inclined like so many that joined the military. But I, I never told the old man that I was leaving at, uh, at 16 and as he was paying the fees, um, and he went absolutely bananas. So he then sent me packing into one of his mates' uh, uh, businesses in a tax office in High Oban in London. So I was there working as sort of office boy and, and general stuff, and it, it was doing my edit. And down at High Oban at the time, I just walked. I hadn't noticed it before, um, but I just had one of those days, and you sat in an office, and you were looking at a clock, and I just knew that this was not me. But I walked past the Royal Navy Royal Marines Recruiting Office, and at the time, they had a poster, and they had a thumbnail picture of every year post the Second World War. And it said in 1968, the Royal Marines took a holiday. And apparently at that time, and I'm talking now sort of early 73. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. You know, the old pictures and everything else. So I just walked in, in my suit and said, well, what's all this about? You know, how do I do it? And he said, well, take your jacket off, do some press-ups, this this Royal Marine recruit. I said, can you do a pull-up or two? So I did that. And he said, well, I sat, sat at a little test. And then about six or eight weeks later, I, I get home and uh, the old man um, says to me, he says, sir, there's an official looking letter for you. And I said, yep. I said, I'm expecting it. And he said, what is it? And so I opened it in front of him. And it was my joining instructions to join the Royal Marines, for which he said, you've got no chance at it. But 22 years later, I merged um, in a, as an experienced member of the best private members club in the world. And uh, that's how I started it all, really. Back when you joined the early 70s, Nigel, was it still, I think, the Royal Marines training is 32 weeks? Uh, it was 32, 32 weeks. I think it's gone up to about 34. And also is that uh, when I joined, so I think 73 to about 75, they did the induction at Deal in Kent. So you chomps down there and it's like, you know, every, every military person goes through it when they go to their training establishment. You know, you, you look around and, you know, we appeared at a deal sort of station and uh, some immaculately smart Royal Marine drill structure starts bellowing and shouting. In the uh, 70s, you all had long hair then. And, and that was it. You know, you started off with a big group of about 60. And I think, you know, in our, in our gang, I think about 18 of us you know, managed to get, you know, to get to the very end. 
you know, never knew it, obviously at that that stage, you know, what a journey, you know, it would be and how you as a human being sort of, uh, you know, evolve and uh, and start to to rationalise, you know. And, um, yeah, if, uh, if I had my time again, absolutely, I would do, do the same again. And it, it was a great journey. Yeah, and the Royal Marines is quite unique in that the officers train alongside the soldiers, don't they, down at Limston? Is that the same yeah. in your day as well? They absolutely did. And I think that as my career progressed, and, you know, I'll come on to this sort of later on if I if I may, but this co-location of training, when you look at the, the commando training centre as it is, um, where the officers train uh, and are accommodated in the same establishment. So in principle, they, they train side by side. It's uh, an establishment that's serviced by its own railway station. It looks onto the river, river X there, the, you know, the estuary. It's, a, it's a, a unique site. Everybody's changing the English language these days, but it, it really is like a, a military, you know, college, you know, the way that, that you know, that it's set out. And it, it is, um, I think, the crown jewel in, in the UK forces, you know, trading, because in terms of bang for your buck, you know, there's no duplication. So all of the command training, so for the, for the men and women now today, I suppose, so is that the commander training centre also does the promotion courses. Like with the army, I think they go to Sally Bridge and do junior Bracken Beacons or senior. Well, in the Marines, you do a, a Marine and then you go back to your junior command course, which takes you for corporal, then a senior command course, which takes you to sergeant. And then you do an advanced command course, which takes you to warrant officer. And in between that, you would do a TQ's course to go and run a store and count masking tapes and all that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal setup. And, you know, I think it just gets better and better, you know, that place and the organisation within it. Yeah, I mean, and, Kev have talked about in the podcast a few times that the Marines appears to be a very swept up, rounded organisation. The Army's struggling to work out what the Army's for at the minute. But the Royal Marines don't exactly what they're for. And, you know, they've come up with future commando force to give them that direction. You yeah. see the recruiting campaigns, yeah. really professional. You know, I look at those ads and think, yeah, I can see why somebody would want to join the Royal Marines. So, yeah, without a doubt, the, they are certainly not identity challenged like I think the Army is these days. I think that's quite, quite an astute statement. I think what, when you look back and you reflect, the, the Marines establishes very early on is its own sort of culture and its identity. And I think by having the, you know, the Royal Marine officers there and the guys do it at the same time is that culture is inbred. It's not like going to Sanders or Dartless or, you know, wherever the RAF go, you know, where they get their commission and then they go and join their units or squadron or battalions or whatever else it is. From day one, both entities, you know, are sort of, um, you know, cohabiting under the, the sort of the history and the legacy and everything else. And it really orientated towards the, you know, the team player. It's not like the individual. It's through the prism of my time. If you looked at Hereford, if you like, you know, it, it was more of an individualistic, what the individual can do. It was all about that in the Marines and certainly in my time, and I'm sure it's the same now. It's about your oppo, it's about your buddy, it's about looking after that and, and working in the mountains and, and Norway. There's always the buddy-buddy system as you're checking for cold weather injuries. And, mm. and then when you look at that commando training centre and you look at how, you know, the MLs evolved and you've got BBT and now, you know, its successor, the SRS, it happens because you've got good corporals and good marines, good sergeants. But primarily it happens because they've got outstanding staff officers, you know, and these lads, because they've gone through the routine, it's the process, they've got some ownership of it and they understand exactly what's trying to be expressed. And of course they convert that onto their papers and, uh, and, and their direction. So when they're pushing forward the, the documents for, uh, you know, for executive inclusion for commando force and future force and, and everything else, they've got very much more, wrapped in and I think it's it's a very powerful place and I think that's why well, you know whilst it's still gonna fight for its money because you know it's it's Lord and Master now is the Navy because when I was going through we had four arms of the service so the Army, Navy, Air Force and we had the Royal Marines and the Royal Marines had its own three star headquarters. 
actually in the MOD, and I, I'll come on to that. I had two and a half years there as an assistant public relations uh, officer. It was a, in a strange time, great for lodging allowance. But, um, you know, the, the Marines then in the 80s, big budget cuts, et cetera. So, so the Marines had to sacrifice something. So they had to lose a star. So they lost the three star there to decide then whether they're going to go Army. So they could have easily have chosen to go underneath the Army brand or stay with the Navy. The amphibious operations was always going to be the, you know, the, the key thing. So they then came down to a two star and, and then got subordinated under the, you know, the, the Navy. But I mean, life has moved on and I mean, I'll talk about him later on, but we've just gone through a coronation of our king and the, there was a chap that carried the crown to our sovereign. And that guy was uh, was an ML. I uh, was one of the guys that took him through his MLs course, and uh, and he became the vice chief of defence staff, and that's a guy called Sir Gordon uh, Messenger, and he's the first Royal Marine never to get that level. It's a system that works, and they're very flexible, very nimble, very agile, and because they're small, and I think also what's fundamentally different with the Marines when you compare it to the Army, etc., is that is that because it's has a lot of Navy traditions built within it, is that Within the army, I, I think you generally leave training and you, and you stay with the battalion. You could be with that battalion all your all your life. In the Marines, you move on every two years, so you have a uh, three commander units, forty four five four two. So you do a couple of years in one, and then you move to another. So you you start to broaden your network within the Royal Marines. So what's also quite different is that as you move up. You know, and certainly when the Marines had its own like helicopter squadron, you know, invariably you knew the pilots because you'd been Marines together. Everybody's on the same message, and therefore that trust is immediate. You're not having to rebuild bridges of trust in, in terms of operation. And when I went back with Rod and, and the rest of the Cardinal lads to this SRS briefing, I mean, I have to say, I mean, we were massively impressed by the quality of the presentations being given by just the young Marines. It's, uh, it's, it's Sensei fans. It's, it really is an impressive uh, organisation. I first became with the other card when I saw a documentary on the unit in the mid-80s called Behind the Lines, and you can still get that on YouTube. And more recently, I read Rod Boswell's account of Cardinal Ops in the South Atlantic, a book called Mountain Commandos at War in the Falklands, which is also my book choice for this episode. We'll discuss it in a bit more depth later on. But before we get into the main meat of the podcast, Nige, it'd be useful if you could give us a brief history of the Carda leading up to the Falklands from their, from their inception at the start of commando forces in World War II and the establishment of the Commando Snow and Mountain Training Centre in Braemar in 1942. The spiritual home of the of the commandos is at Acknacarry, at uh, just north of Fort William in northwest of Scotland. After Churchill would create the commando commando forces, and 1942, the uh, the Commando Snow and Mountain Training Centre was established in Braemar. Its objective was to was to train commando troops to fight in high snow covered mountain bases. There's a lot of volatility in terms of what it was called and, and where it was at, where it was based. Then in '43, in, in preparation for the invasion of uh, of Europe, that centre moved to St Ives in Cornwall and had a site name change um, to the Commando Mountain Warfare Training Centre, and it stayed sort of put in the, in that region, you know, through the '40s and '50s. And during the 50s, it, it then evolved and became the, the Cliff Assault Wing. Um, and this is the first time where we start getting a dedicated specialisation within the Royal Marines called CLs, Cliff Leaders. We then had the Cliff Assault Troop that was based in Bickley. This is just outside Plymouth on the edge of Dartmoor there, which is the home of 4-2 Commando. And in the late 50s, it went back up to the Cairngorms to Lenmore Lodge, uh, where it was then running in a sort of three-week winter course. It's in preparation of, of going to, to Norway. And in 1963, around about that time, 63, 64, the cold weather warfare courses then started deploying straight to Norway. So this is the first time then that uh, the guys are getting... Um, 
some real exposure of of winter warfare on snow and and you can imagine the kit and equipment issued at that time was at best base you know and uh, that must have been cold trips for those lads i have to say so in 67 uh, we got a, a name change again and the cliff assault troop uh, it sort of evolves and and the re- rl the reconnaissance leader becomes a key skill with um, the focus on on the field craft aspect of being in the, in the rocks and, and the mountain. Now, 1970, the, the Mountain Arctic Warfare calendar was actually established at the same time that uh, the UK had a, a military obligation to the, to the northern flank of NATO. And 4-5 uh, and Commando was given the task as, as being that dedicated unit to build up the expertise. And they were based in Plymouth at the time, and in 71, they uh, they moved up to, to Arbrose in, in Scotland, uh, where they still are, in, and that's called Condor. And that took us through to that point there, where at the point of the uh, Mountain Arctic Warfare card being established, we then moved the SQs from RL to ML as Mountain Leader. So we've gone from Cliff Leader to Reconnaissance Leader, and now to Mountain Leader the same focus of, of people are still doing that, that, those same tasks and that stayed up at Condor right up until 1982. So that's the history to that point there before we went down to Falklands. So what made you decide then to join the Carter? Like most of the young lads that certainly went to 4-5 or five at that time is that you, you, you finish your training. Now I finished my training in sort of February 74 and I did the 74 South Armagh trip. We then came back and we then got into to mountain training. And all of this, as it, it was an eighteen-year-old, nineteen-year-old kid, is is you know you got eyes on stalks, you know, because uh, did the island trip. Okay, you, that was part of an experience. But you start doing mountain training, and, you know, and you thought, well, I've I've gone through Royal Marine basic training. This this should be okay. <laughs> wrong <laughs> you know you start to you know you, you get taken to places like the Isle of Skye west coast of Scotland you know in October November time you know where where you get proper Scottish rain that hits you horizontally at about 45 miles an hour so found out between those early years of 74 say through to to 77 is that you spent sort of September through to April cold wet and happy he says but there were challenging times and because a lot of the unit was very physically orientated within the Marines, and the Marines has its specialist qualifications. So you can become a PTI, you can become a personal weapons instructor, you can become a pilot, you can become a mountain leader. And all of these have a tier system, a three, two, one. So as a three, you would do those specialist qualifications as a Marine as a two, you do it generally as a corporal. As a one, generally you do it as a sergeant. So at that time, SBS were only taking Marines. You could only go there as a Marines. And SBS at that stage were just a specialist unit within the Royal Marines. Now, the Royal Marines and the general duties of the Royal Marines always viewed SBS as being of SF quality. And that took them 20 odd years on from there before they was actually designated that. You can imagine just the politics that were, were being prescribed. But I went down to do my SB selection. I passed that and uh, I was put on to the next course. At the same time, I was playing a lot of unit squash and playing in the county leagues around around Scotland. But I badly injured my back, so I could not go on to the next SB course that uh, I was down for. Uh, at the same time, in that intervening period, I was then forwarded from my junior command course which meant money. We talk about 70s, there was not a lot of it about. So I could have probably said no for that, wait for the next SB course, but uh, I was going to do that. So then I uh, did my course for, for becoming a corporal. And to become an ML at that time, you had to be a corporal. You could not do that as a Marine. So the next opportunity then was I do the, the MLs course. And the reason for for that was that it was just logical because in 4-5 Command at the time, most of my peer group did one or three things. Either went down to Paul, either become a PTI, or they went to ML. That was the, the three sort of the key things. And because I'd spent those years 
those four or five years going to Norway, going into the mountains and having sort of after the first couple of uh, years, you know, getting used to being cold, wet and miserable and, and, and becoming very comfortable in those environments. And at the time we had giants on the branch. There were three key characters, you know, and I won't name them, but they were very... You know, everybody said, "Wow!" You know, very powerful. And we thought, "Well, if you know, if I could sort of get to stand on on the shoulders of these giants, that would be quite something." So to get through the ML course, let alone you know to be then selected to join the Calibre itself, which was something I, I wanted to try and do. And at that time, we we had the, the ML training as such had no no selection courses, so you you just drafted and they joined. You know, September. But the attrition rate, you know, through the first months, because the ML course of its time, it started September and it finished in March. And mm. basically, September was a very hard month down in Cornwall. Then October, it's sort of, uh, you're in, into Wales, you know. And the key thing about the September thing, I mean, in terms of, of physicality, you know, there was a lot, a lot of fizz that wore you down. And of course, then you had to do your night climb to a certain standard and to get through that. And then you moved on to Wales and that was more sort of mounting navigation, a bit more climbing. But then from Wales, you moved on to what was then the survival exercise on the Isle of Ida, where they stripped you and you put in World War II clobber and you were given clean acreage, which is quite a unique experience, which is quite different from that that you do at Hereford in terms of, of the way that they were running it. At the time, it, it is he's just seeing how you actually cope being without anything normal and how your body degrades. You know, so you can be walking across a couple of acres of field and on day one, it'll just have a little stream and you can bound across that quite easy. But come day seven, you'll be lucky if you hit the other side, and and that's the weather. And then you get taken away, and and you go through the you know, resistance to interrogation stuff. And then you get to November, and those that had not been to Norway before, or who had not skied before, went to Rukum to do the the military ski course there. And those that uh, that were already sort of military ski instructors stay behind and help with mountain training with, with the trained sort of card up MLs. And then you go to, to Norway and uh, you, you end up in Norway on the, the final exercise, which is a 200 kilometer, 10 day in the field. The distance per se over 10 days is not that 200. It's the actual snow conditions at the time that you're either going to have a good period of time or bad, because if you get too much new fresh snow, then you're trudging in deep snow and you're expounding so much energy. Or if it's very blowy, you've got sort of this stukugi effect as they, they have on the snow, which is very hard. So if you're descending, you get guys that are falling over and if they've got 80, 90, 100 pound packs on their backs and it can take them time to pick up. So all of this sort of stuff. I think just for listeners that are maybe not soldiers in the Arctic, though, it's, it's like the jungle, it requires a lot of self discipline. A lot of good teamwork, you know, mm. if, you, if you've got a pull pole at six o'clock in the morning, everybody's got to be there, ready to go. And if you've got somebody mucking about with a kit, discipline required to build your positions and uh, set up a false position, a dummy position maybe. So mm. if you're doing that for all those days over that length of time, and imagine that's what just saps you. It, yeah, good all the time. Yeah, I mean, I was always, uh, you know, at the time, it was becoming quite sort of, you know, the thing, you know, train hard fight easy well that's that's fine i mean you can expect people to do that but for me it was about being brilliant at the basics yeah and that's what you talk about you know being good admin and the the thing about the guys who who, who go to norway and work in the mountains is that uh there is no other way you, you have to be on the ball in terms of getting your admin you know sorted out Prize, you know, a pair of dry socks, and even if it's minus 15 blowing a hoolie and you've got dry kit and, and your warm sleeping bag, got to take that off, you know, and you're going to put wet stuff back on and you just got to get out there, mm. get out there and do it, you know, because if that dry stuff can give you three hours good sleep, then you'll take that, like when it winning the lottery. That application 
of the very basic skills is phenomenally demanding. It's a strength of character. And I think that one of the one of the reasons and the reason detra for why the, the ML course is so physically demanded. I mean, I had many a chat, you know, when I was in and if you look at Hereford or SB, although they do joint selection now and have done for some time, is that there's little differential in terms of, of the physical requirements for, for both of those specialisations. Because you're looking for, you know, when everybody is absolutely exhausted. You wanting people that's what another twenty percent left in the tank. When I look back at our times when we're doing that, you know, the, the first thing about to always remember, you know, going to the lectures is that the the first part of of going to war was was learning how to survive. Do that before you can even contemplate learning how you could, you know, do involve your mobility tactics and everything mm. else. That's a big separator of people in terms of of how they operate and um yeah i think you, you you hit you've hit the nail on the head there it, it is about that and that 200k final exercise is that the final phase and if you've passed that are you in the card order for a base no, period no, you finished that and then we went to north norway up to the uh, uh the Leon alps um for more high mountain uh skills and uh, climbing and again you, you get to the roadhead but to get to the campsite you know it's about 4k away so you, you have to pull all the stuff up you know to make the camp so that could be three trips so you've done 20k in a day before you get your head down you know and then you'd be, you then we then came back from that back into to scotland and then we did 10 days in Fort William, around Ben Nevis, etc., where it was more mountain navigation, more rope work, more climbing up the gullies. Um, and at that point, then, you know, you complete it. You then get told yes or no. And then you get told where you're being drafted. So I completed my my ML2 course and uh, told I'd done quite well and, uh, and actually I was being drafted to the Cardo. So I was, I was dead chuffed. There was a lot of people that did the ML course and then returned back to the commandos. Being an ML, which is I certainly liked about it and everything else, it's just nothing special about it. It's just a, a Royal Marines general duty SQ. So anybody can apply for it and you do it. So a lot of guys go back to all the commando units. So we're within a commando structure, yeah. having unit ML1. Hopefully every company has an ML1 sergeant and a couple of ML2 corporals. And, and it brings back that sort of experience. So, yeah, they go back to the command. And a lot of guys like that. They, they like going back to the, the, the commander units. So not everybody wants to, to work quite hard and, on the same thing. So it, uh, it works out for everybody, I think. Rod Boswell took command of the card in 1980, two years before the Falklands, and writes in his book that he felt the unit needed to change from a training programme that emphasised climbing, whilst, in his opinion, slowly reducing military skill levels. He also wanted to alter the perception by some of the core that the Cara was, and I quote, just a bunch of professional climbers. Uh, you'd been the Cara for about a year before he arrived. Can you give an overview on the changes he made and what you thought of them at the time? I think the first thing to, to note, and, and he, he was spot on in what he was saying, because the, there was a view, I'm sure, that was conveyed through the, the Royal Marines executive and certainly at Brigade, that that's all they, they saw the, the Carter do. And I think it was quite a, an erroneous perception held by them because at the end of each sort of Norway deployment, when we had the big brigade NATO exercises, the Carter supplied uh, two teams with the with the SBS, maybe more, to for the advanced force role and uh, and, and reconnaissance and, and field intelligence on those exercises. That alone, the Calder at that time had no wartime role. So it was only doing, you know, what was asked of it. I suppose it was exacerbated that five weeks of the year then was in the Alps, um, you know, sort of climbing in the Alps or, or anything else, which sounds rather grand, but when you're carrying a heavy sack, you know, and you're thinking, well, you know, what would it be like to bring 100 guys up there through through these gunnings, etc.? And that's where the lessons are learned because you just can't get that, you know, anywhere else. It didn't help with the with the perception management that, uh, you know, it was seen as perhaps a jolly and not, not, not as a learning tool. But I'd say if you look at 
you know, the mountains of Afghanistan, I think there's a lot of skill sets and, and knowledge that was able to be shared because of, the, of those experiences. And of course, at that same time, uh, before Boswell arrived, is that the NATO's northern flank, and there was a lot of pain and grief in the MOD because a lot of units were being, you know, being reduced. So there's a lot of army units that are looking for roles, you know, securing their, their sort of future. Therefore, the training demands on, on the Carter were, were just growing exponentially. It was a busy old time. It was spot on with what he wanted to achieve. And, uh, and of course, what he wisely did, he understood that three commander brigade really w- wasn't getting the, uh, it, it could get a far bigger bang for its buck, if you like, uh, by liberating the obvious talents that were sort of encapsulated within the Mountain Warfare Calder specifically and the ML uh, specialization and thereby secure the brigade uh, with its own de- dedicated surveillance and reconnaissance force for, for all theatres. And so therefore, he, before he joined, he got down to the brigade to see uh, the guy who was the chief of staff there, and it was later to go on to become the, the, the brigadier, and of course that's General Thompson. And um, he was obviously of the same mindset, was absolutely immediately hooked to that vision, what Boswell wanted to do. So that was quite a smart move by Boswell at that time. So when he arrived at the Carter, he sort of said to the guys, right, you know, this is what I want to do, expecting some huge pushback, but actually he was just, he was pushing an open door. What we were all keen on, I think, was that the fact that uh, this movement to having a brigade Ricky force um, sort of at that time is that we were keen to, it should be retained within the sort of general duties of the Royal Marines. It was nothing there being set up to compete with the SBS or the SAS. You know, if you wanted to go SF, you know, they were established. That's what they did. But this was, you know, for, for a brigade asset. But of course, is to enhance those skills and create a vision that, this is exactly what uh, that would help the brigade. When he came up and, and did that, and I spoke about the the pressures of more and more army units coming in, and uh, therefore at that same time, he wanted to unleash this sort of you know grand plan, but then was given a straitjacket because uh, in eighty one he had to uh, run two ML two courses that year. And in September 81, I, I did my ML1 scores. But he, what, what he did do is he, he took he took about six or eight guys out. And, and we weren't a big unit at the time, when it's its imagination. And he got them on to the Combat 6 course down at Hereford. Um, and he got the two senior NCOs that were there to uh, start looking at uh, creating SOPs, etc. for through a card of strength. So that, you see, he created two, was it two four-man teams to, you know, to, to do that. And they recalibrated elements at that stage of sort of ML training and, and the skill set needed to sort of come into this vision that was still very much at the Genesis stage. But the fact that they were doing training with 148, so fire mission training and all the other bits and pieces were in parallel running the two courses. So, of course, we get to the end of that uh, training cycle of 81, which is now March, April 82. And, of course, then the Falklands kicks off. And, um, you know, that was just timely. He set the scene and he set the template to enable broader thinking and the application of resources for future ML training with the traditional cliff assault element to that to assimilate the needs to deep penetration patrols. So he actually set the, set the framework up and that was important because there's not much he can do because they only get two years at these jobs. Mm-hmm. But what he did do had far-reaching consequences you know, um, you know, for the benefit of everybody. When you look at it, um, some people might not know, but the future of the Royal Marines was actually in question just before the Falklands War. 
without a doubt, Rod Boswell were very, very timely in getting the car set up to do the brigade recce piece and also what the Marines achieved as well, uh, secured their future at the Fultons at that point. Uh, I think it was a happy sort of coincidence that came along because at the end of sort of 81, Boswell then was formally informed by a brigade that they needed to put their headquarters, the Carter needs to be co-located with the brigade which was down in Stunthouse Barracks in Plymouth. So when all the two courses and the ones courses finished in sort of March, April, 82, not only were the courses finishing, but people were sort of preparing to sort of go on leave as we, as we all were. I mean, I was in September or August of the previous year in 81 and bought my house in Plymouth because I knew I'd be going to 40 commando uh, on completion of my ones course. Um, so I bought a house down there, but never lived in it until I got back from the Falklands in July. The opportunity that the Falklands gave Boswell and the brigade was the catalyst that started everything else off, I think, in terms of the development of, of the of the card and the BBT and the SRS without doubt. So when the Falcons kicked off, you were a corporal and a recently qualified ML1. The car they all back for the disc deployment, I believe, was um, eight four-man teams and a yeah. HQ section. We were because Rod had had, had still got because guys had not yet been formally what what the Marines call drafted. I posted to to their next sort of uh, jobs or units. Uh, he retained them, and of course. At this particular time, everything is up in the air. Um, so he very quickly spoke to the people who were responsible for, for drafts and, and said, well, you still got them, so therefore, you know, you manage it. And from that, he quickly put his all back together. But one of the key things with Rod was to find out how many he could actually take because it, bed spaces were key on, on the shipping going down. So we had to leave our inspiring sole major at the time there, um, because they you just didn't have enough beds on the on the boats to go down, so that it was rejigging. There were some guys that was carrying sort of casts. There was one guy who literally died on a climbing accident but recovered, um, but he was still too weak to go down. So by the time you'd put the, the all bats together and then get them kitted out and equipped, we then, you know, were given our team. So Callum Murray, who was a Young officer, just finished his, his ML2s course, so he became my team leader. I was the ML1 for the team. Um, Steve Nicol, he and I had known each other for years because it, we were both in 4-5 or five together. And uh, and Bookshop had just qualified off that twos course. So that was our um, team. And uh, and then Steve had also attended the uh, Combat 6 course. So that was us as a, as a sort of ad hoc quartet like everybody else, and um, we did the bonding on the way south. What was the the commando's um, thoughts on your, your mission? What was your going to be your task when you got down there? I think it was very clear from the start, allied to what Rod's vision was. It, was, it wasn't about being an offensive organisation. We weren't going to be SAS, SBS, three you know so it, it was about the surveillance and it was about the field intelligence and it was about doing the you know the silent work as an advanced force within the brigade and i think that was quite right and clever because you had those two doing what they did by the time we got down towards the ascension we were told that we were going to go down to south georgia because that was just a debacle with what hereford did there so we weren't involved in that so that was very clear in what we were going to do. Obviously, we'll go through what we were doing down there, you know, in, in, in due course. How well equipped were you for the South Atlantic? I mean, we've had this discussion with other guests that the Commando Brigade is obviously more suited to these sort of extremes and their equipment is better than, let's say, the Army. The Army would obviously, whatever you could get off the shelf. So how well equipped was the MAW Carter? Well, I think you're right. I mean, because the MAW Carter was uh, was augmented within four or five commando, um, the kit and equipment that we had was sufficient for that of 
you know, the northern flank of operating in, in Norway and the mountains. So we had no issues with kit. I mean, the weaponry that we had were AR-15s and SLRs. I think we had M-74s. We had the 66s. We had FOSS and fragmentation grenades. Each had a had our own personal 9mm pistol there. We carried HF radios, 320s, night sights, for scopes, binos, you know, the Russians, the Arctic Russians, first aid morphine, stitching kit, cam nets, obviously just jam- the ammunition lot to, you know, to go with that. So we were well equipped, I mean, in terms of, of, of clothing, etc. And, and, and a lot of us would have, would have had our own sort of specialist civilian clothing that you would just buy to facilitate it. When you're working in in those extreme temperatures, it's quite interesting that a lot of people won't realise is actually that when you're working, you don't actually wear a lot of clothing under your smock. You've probably got just a t-shirt on, you know, because you're sweating so much because you're carrying, you know, eighty, ninety, hundred pound. Don't need that. You just need the ability to to keep stuff dry, so you can you can get some sort of quality sleep, you know, as and when you can. And it's about looking after yourself. And I think. Trench foot was a big issue for a lot of people down there, but predominantly, I think the the casualties of that were on a lot of the army ranks because just weren't used to operating in those conditions. You know, they all had sort of DMS boots or you know whatever else it was. But um, it is the ability that before you fire any weapon, etc., you know, you're going to look after your feet. And when you talked about previously about having good field admin, the ability to look after your feet you know, and your body first, and when you can eat, eat get it in you, and, um, and that's what it was. So we were quite happy, I think, with, with the kit and equipment that we had for the job that we had to do. If you set a soldier and a Marine down the bar and ask them to talk about boots, that's going to be a topic they'll go on all night, but, you know, you mentioned the DMS boot down there, which is quite a mm. crap bit mm. kit. Was it all privately purchased boots, the card, or did you issue sort of...? Um, no, we, I mean... We were issued mounting boots, etc., but you wouldn't wear them. We did not wear them, uh, as I recall, down the Falklands. Uh, I mean, I remember I, I actually went out, went out once I knew where we were going, and uh, I then went down to the inn and sort of got the weather charts for the last what, twenty odd years, and looked at the terrain. And I, I went and bought a pair of uh, Canadian hunting boots. Uh, which was a Vibram sole, and, uh, you know, I had perfect feet all the way through it. And that was the only sort of difference I had there. I mean, thermal underwear and some very lightweight stuff. Gore-Tex wasn't in there, wasn't really sort of in at that stage. We had duvets, which was uh, which was a, a bonus over and above the regular issue equipment for people. But other than that, we were fairly standard in, in, in what we got compared to when I... Did a, a visit the other week there to see what they get issued now. I mean, it's chalk and cheese. But when the Commando Snow Mountain School was happening, when they first went to, to Norway, I mean, they had reindeer mats. I mean, that was it. <laughs> that uh, they, they learned the hard way. But again, you look at that and you then look at Scott and the Antarctic, all your mitts and everything else, and they survive for, for months and months. So People climbing, you know, women were climbing mountains in the Alps in, you know, 1870s, 1890s. Well, you, you look at the cl- cliff leaders, the, the predecessors of the car, they were doing it in blooming battle dress, wouldn't they? That's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and ammo uh, boots. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so again, it's about being brilliant at the basics. Is that it's nice that you can have all this and they probably used health and safety as a lever to pull in yeah. order to, to help the argument to get, you know, this particular line of equipment. You embarked on the RFA resource the 5th of April to start your journey south, and you arrived in San Carlos Water via Ascension Island on the 21st of May. Um, what was your voice south like? And you could talk us through operations from the landings up to just prior to the raid on Top Marble House on the 31st of May. The last week in March, the MR1's course, the MR2's course, had, had sort of completed. And the Falklands was invaded the 2nd of April, and Saturday the 3rd of April, we were having the end of courses, sort of uh, dinner and dance, or a bit of a bit of a shindig as as we do. They'll you know dress up in that black tie, etc., and, and have, have quite a nice night. But entire that entire weekend, I mean, because 
the entire establishment of the of the Kana was packed up to move down to be relocated to Stone Labs. You had to strip these containers out and get the kit and, and everything else and create the ore bat. So that was everything was just brushed. And on the fifth of April, which I think was was the was the Monday, we then got the coaches around to Ross Life to get on board the resource, which we co shared with SBS and a rifle company from four five command, a Zulu company. The transit down from Sis to the eighteenth of April on the way to Ascension was nothing more than getting briefings. Physical exercise was a massive component of the day. Getting into the teams of full working out IA drills, uh, the immediate action drills, lots of SIGs training, lots of kit packing and unpacking and, and sorting out how things would work. We did get a lot of maps, if I remember, so a lot of uh, you know, studying of the terrain. And that happened right through until we got to the Ascension Islands. And the Ascension Islands was like a core reunion party. Because every naval ship was parked up. It was the biggest car park of naval shipping. And of course, when you went ashore, you're meeting everybody. So, I mean, it was quite a social event. We had one event where one night, I think, uh, the brigade had come through and we actually deployed on the island of Ascension because it was rumoured that the Argentines had had a submarine sighted off Ascension. We had to go out and put some screening OPs around there, but we did that for a couple of days, then came back and nothing to it really. We then moved ship we was cross dock because the the ship that we were on was was that that was going to go down to to South Georgia. So we then moved onto Tristan, it was a uh, LSL. We then crossed the line, as they say, um, on the equator around about the seventeenth of of April. On that particular day was the day that should have got married in the UK. Um, so I was found guilty of failing to turn up to, you know, to my wedding. <laughs> but we then actually had a, um, uh, a wedding ceremony uh, in lieu of that on board the ship. A good mate of mine, Alan, he was my wife. And so we weren't going to be going down to South Georgia. So he, he really reconfigured his, uh, his, his Arctic cam stuff. And the skipper of the ship had given up his stateroom for the day, and that was the altar. Yeah, I've made a suit uh, out of uh, rubbish bags, etc., and put masking tape down as make it like pinstripes. You know, the forklift trucks on board were, were the cars. The civilian chefs on board had made a big wedding cake. It was followed by a good meal and a huli, and uh, <laughs> a good way to... Uh, to let the steam out. In fact, it, I mean that's covered in Boswell's book. But it was a um, it was a good day. And what was quite funny is somebody had taken photos and at some point sent it home to his mum. And then the next thing, I get a letter from Anne, my wife to be, concerned because she'd been sent from the Glasgow Evening Herald. There was a double page spread about our wedding. <laughs> and first of all, she thought I got married to somebody else called Alana. <laughs> and, uh, so we we had that, and you and Nigel, I've got to say, mate, it doesn't take much to get a, a Royal Marine to uh, get dressed up in a a, a frock. Well, it's, it's the third line of equipment. You know, you learn very early on as a Royal Marine that you need your fancy dress rig. Yeah, that was uh, it was amazing. When we left Ascension, you could sense the mood changing, and that um, you know perhaps this was going to happen because it had been preordained that we were only going to be working in the vaults of the of three commander brigade. We actually weren't deployed until the, the evening of the landings. So three teams and the team that I was in were sent to um, Evelyn Hill, which overlooked Teal Inlet, uh, Bull Hill and Mount Simon. So it was like a, a picket array of OPs down that side of the Falklands. So we spent about seven days um, looking at uh, at Teal Inlet and uh, and then reporting sort of the, the activity that we could see. What were your OP positions like, Nigel? Were you in like, folds in the ground with cabinets overhead or you in boulders? Some were like shell scrape. I think we were lucky 
in the Falklands in terms of French experience gained from going to South Omar, but people wrongly assume that they they get themselves into a hole, and because they think people are, are you know are difficult to be seen, that that you've got a good position. But if you've got things like cows or sheep, yeah. you know the farmers of the land understand their animals, and the animals behave in a very predictable way. So even if you go there and you're thinking nobody can see us, if these you know, animals start then behaving quite differently, already the farmers you know say, well, why is that happening? So thankfully, we had none of the issue there with, in terms of, of livestock being at that distance away from the settlement. Definitely not spacious, definitely sort of, you know, you're open to the elements. And it was during the daylight hours and of the night time, no lights at all. You know, you're looking down towards Teal Inlet and people are on natures of habit. You know, if you go outside your local village or the street, People tend to put their lights on at a certain time or they turn them off at a certain time or they come in and they leave at a certain time. Or... So we were deployed on to, to there by the 21st of May. And then on the 24th of May, back at where Bosel was with the Calder HQ, there was a, an army guy working at Brigade, Hector Gulland. Now, Hector Gulland was the, the troop boss there for the SAS siege of the embassy. So it was part of his army career. He was then doing a staff job within brigade. He had tasked Boswell at that stage to, to get across to, to West Falkland to observe an Argentine OP position near Mount Rosalie. This stage, of course, we have already heard of the debacle with the, with the SES on South Georgia. So one was very conscious about um, you know, having to sort of uh, get engaged you know, with them because there was not a lot of confidence with the way that they operated. And this sort of reinforced it, because when Boswell was getting uh, briefed, and one of the concerns that he had with us was the fear that, that although the Falklands was quite a large piece of real estate, once you start throwing people on it, it gets quite crowded quite quickly. So the chances of blue on blue are, are very real. I mean, you could argue that there were too many recce elements on the island, when you take into account, you'd have the recce troops from the commandos and the, the army regiments. You'd have Carter doing the brigade stuff. You had Hereford there. The who reads Roger's book will find that he's not too complimentary about Hereford. He said that they weren't team players. They didn't deconflict. I'm picking that up from what you were saying a little bit ago there. I mean, a good friend of mine was, was in with the actual ops briefings down at South Georgia, the Marines... Senior officer Guy Sheridan at that time was probably the most experienced individual in UK land forces in mountain operations. And he had Harris up there. Every man and his dog was saying, you know, do not go on to, to the glacier with, with the choppers. I mean, it's, it was absolutely crazy. And because they had these satcoms and they were going back to the UK, they actually went, went back to... Um, uh, Sterling Lines, and uh, I think it was Bronco Lane, who had climbed Everest, you know, a few years before, that advised them that that's exactly what they should do. And a very good friend of mine, who was the who was the MM charge with the recce troop there, said, "Well, look, do give us your your, your radio, for instance, because if we got to come and get you, we want to be able to talk to you because we're we're concerned about the blue and blue, and they, you know, wouldn't even do that." And you had all all this sort of issues going on. Of course, when they went ashore, you know, they had a, a contact with seals. All this type of stuff. And I've had lots of good mates that's in Hereford and a lot of good operators. But I think the, the, the command and control element of Hereford at that time was, was, was nothing short of appalling. And on this particular operation to get across to, to West Falklands, when Wood was getting his brief, the CO of 2-2 was actually on the brief because obviously Hector Gulland and the 2-2 CO would have known each other very, very well. And at that stage, the, the CO of 2-2 was insistent for the car to go across, um, but they only go to this particular beach. Now, this particular beach was actually the ERV for Captain Hamilton. He that sadly lost his life on, on West Falklands. Had they got across and found this sort of OP, then they would come back. This is the car to teams, and a couple more teams would go out there. And then the, the task would have been to take out that particular OP. But for three days, 
they couldn't get across. The, they'd got two ribs and then one flooded and there was another LCU-type boat and that didn't sort of work and they couldn't actually get across there. And old Rose was had a sort of a hissy fit with uh, Boswell at the time, apparently, because um, he couldn't get across. And at that stage, we were not to have known that that was Hamilton's ERV. Had Hamilton sort of been able to, to get out, you know, and had the card gone across, he could have had a blue on blue very, very easy. That was sort of adding salt to the wound and, and making us extremely cautious in our planning and our approach to being out there in, in sort of, you know, no man's land. And, and you're right. And that's where Hector Gullen's job became very, very important because people realised very early on is that the SES would not share information and therefore eyes around the back of your head to make sure that the space that you were going into, you know, was clear of friendlies. So on the 27th of May, we then get a message comes into our OP at uh, overlooking to then that we, we then get tasked to meet up with the two other OPs and RV at Bull Hill. Now, from where Teal Inlet, where we were in our OP to there, was only about, I suppose, 16 miles, I suppose, as crow flies, and given about eight or nine hours to, you know, to make that distance. But the thing about the Falklands are these stone runs. Many of us have spent a lot of time in Sky and going across the street there. But these boulder runs and um, and working sort of in advance of everybody else, it became the most painful sort of 12 hours of my life. You know, we all do things and we always remember one thing in our life. And I always remember that journey to, to that RV because it was... Horrendous. It, <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, we got to Bull Hill. That was absolutely fine. And, and we eventually got picked up um, on the 30th of May. And at that stage, the temperature had dropped, run out of rations about uh, two days before because we weren't expecting that. So we're, we're getting quite degraded as within ourselves. And then at the same time, about 28th of May, four teams from the Calder HQ then deployed in and around the area of the Marlow geography, so the Marlow River and uh, and sort of southwest of that. And it was one of those OPs that had ID'd uh, what turned out to be 602 Special Commander and Special Forces Unit, you know, moving into to top Marlow House. As this was going on, we were actually being picked up eventually by a chopper to go back then to the Cardor HQ. And it was a very busy time because once Boswell had got confirmation that one of the teams had seen this and, and clocked it, then Rod then went into, into brigade and said to the brigade commander, look, you know, this is what's happened. And he, he obviously pitched that uh, as he found it, you know, he should be, be allowed to go and sort it. And uh, the general sort of, or the brigadier said, yeah, crack on. So... We turned around quite quickly and we had the orders to, uh, that night to prepare for a dawn sort of takeoff to do the assault the next day. Before you go to the assault, I mean, there's a quote from Major General uh, Julian Thompson, who was a commander for EP8, and he wrote that the CADA carried out a number of brilliant operations, but to me, the piece de resistance was their action at Top Marlow House. The outcome was to eliminate the Argentinian Special Forces OPs from the high ground overlooking Three Commando and their approach to Mount Kent and its adjoining features, the jumping off place for the brigade's battles for Stanley. So the Argentines were made unaware of their approach by this route and the direction of the initial attacks came as a surprise. The top Mola ha battle is a demonstration of how a small body of men can have an influence on the course of one phase of a campaign. I think the general is very generous, I think, in, in his praise. And the objective was to get there, take it out and job done. And I'll, I'll talk later on. I think there was another operation that the uh, that the CADA did was actually, in terms of, of professional skills, was equal to or better than the top Marlow thing. I mean, in military terms, it's, it was normally the power of three, isn't it? Company size strength will take on a troop size strength. And we were, I think, 19 strong. I think there were 12 in the assault group. I was in the fire group, and there were seven of us, and there were 34 of them. 
like everybody else, it was intense, uh, absolutely intense at the time. We had uh, three guys shot, Steve and Groves is no longer with us, died of cancer. He was the sniper. He, just, he was the first guy to slot one of the Argentines that he saw at the top window. We had uh, one of the guys, Lucky, Lucky, he got shot through the arm. And of course, it sort of um, it stopped him in his tracks. But once they start patching him up, they found on his top left hand pocket, and and before it became an ML, he was a personal weapons instructor. And like a good personal weapons instructor, he had his aid memoir in his top left hand pocket. And in the middle of that pocket, above his heart, was the round that went through his arm. <laughs> so he was he he was lucky enough. And then Chris Stone who got shot in, in the chest. Once things had calmed down, he'd been given morphine. And then I went to, to sit next to him and uh, really concerned for Chris. And I remember sat there, um, this this aspect I, I remember quite vividly. There were five Argentines who had been killed, seven were injured and five were sort of okay. And, and, and they had good kit, you know, the Argentine SF. So I nicked a pair of duvet gloves and thought, oh, they're good. I'll, I'll have some of them. I then went to, to sit with Chris and sort of talking away. And he said, oh, he said, my, I feel really wet in my chest. So I got up and he, it had been shot at the front and uh, found the, you know, the entry route. And, uh, and there was a little sort of trickle of blood coming out there. I said, no, yeah, you, you're great, mate. There's nothing, nothing there. He said, but my back feels very wet. You know, so shock is kicking in there. So lift his sort of, you know, smock up, et cetera, except wounds, massive. And uh, th there's a lot of blood loss, you know. I sort of strip off, get me, get me sort of T-shirt off and pad the wound and uh, try and make it as tight and as comfortable as possible. And, and sort of sit him upright and because his breathing was a bit, uh, a bit shallow at this stage. And of course, we didn't have choppers really to support the brigade just sat sort of chewing the fat and uh, and of course you know humor comes out in most things and he you know so i've looked after his, his front i'm looking after him he said he said my, my hands are cold and i think i'm looking at my soul, <laughs> brand new <laughs> prof duvet gloves <laughs> my gloves you know there's not a problem he said my head's cold said, jesus and, you know, it's like my my best bloody field hat and uh, he has all that can joke about it now but the chopper came just in time. I, I really felt that Chris would have bled out my arms at uh, you know at that time there, but um, he's still around and uh, you know strong as an ox. But it was yeah, we're lucky, you know. But we only had three shot and they all recovered. So after taking uh, several casualties during the battle, and with two sections still in the field, the Carter took some time to reorg at Teal Inlet. Can you cover its operations, supporting the final battles and the recapture of Stanley? Absolutely. We recover back to Teal Inlet and, um, you know, the turnaround time is, is quite quick. I mean, as you'd expect, I suppose. And I was part of the, the same team where we went to a thing called Smoko Mountain, which overlooked uh, Fitzroy and, uh, and Bluff Cove. One team went to Mount Challenger, which is to the rear of 4-2 to observe the south and east. And one team inserted with the with the SBS to look uh, on the on the northeast of the brigade locations, and I'll go through those sort of individually. So Smoker Mountain, it was uh, on the southern route between Stanley and the southern settlements, and we were operating here well in advance of uh, everybody else. So it was quite a large feature there. It was about four hundred meters. Tumble Down was only 249 metres and Harriet 287, Challenger was 255. And Smoker was actually used by the Argentines when they first sort of invaded the Falklands. When we got dropped off and it also commanded a view with the, with the approaches with Bluff Cove and, uh, and Fitzroy. So we had given us a, a great arc of um, observation. And the distance from Stanley... I think it was about 18 linear miles. So we we're, were getting quite close to Stanley at that stage. So the net was closing. And what was quite interesting with this OP as a location you talk, I mean, what was peculiar about it was that it actually had a flight pole at the top of it, which was great for hoisting up the antenna for the HF comms. So it wasn't much of a shelter, but it meant that we could get comms and uh, you know, what, what stones were 
offered, well, you know, provided you know, sufficient sort of windbreak and we sort of had a team chat to say, you know, it's probably about the best that we're going to get. So we, we, we made the, the best of a, of a bad location, really. No sooner we started the OP, all the kit out, etc., the clag had a sort of come in and visibility was was really a challenge. And we couldn't see much further than 50 to 100 metres. And because it was forever shifting, it's not like we could we could go forward because then you could be caught out of the open. So, you know, we, we had to we had to stay put. You know, as the hour sort of went on, all of a sudden the antenna sort of pinged and we started hearing, you know, choppers. And uh, being that we were the furthest forward of the brigade, you know, we went back to a brigade at, uh, so at the Carder HQ there at uh, Teal Inlet. Boswell's got sort of two handsets to his ears, you know, one's talking to us and the other's talking to brigade. And we're saying, you know, please confirm there were no friendly forces, you know, to our front. They were coming back and saying, um, there's nobody there. So after about 15 or 20 minutes of constant healing activity, you could hear the signature of a, of a chin-up and then the clouds lifted and then we could see guys being disgorged from the, the chin-up onto the ground. And because we'd, you know, heard quite a few helicopter trips, it was at least a company strength. So at this stage, here we are, being told quite clearly that there was nobody to our front. We were the furthest. So it could only be sort of bad guys that were going to be sort of offloading. Now, this caught the attention of the brigade because, you know, this was not anticipated. We had asked for a fire mission and uh, two nine led the guns then on, on Kent and, and we were given the, the complete battery. So obviously people were interested in this potential sort of uh, battle picture that was uh, being provided. And because they were to our rear, it means the rounds would have gone over our head onto the target. As you know, as ex-gunners, um, with the various commands going back and forth, you know, the target was, was fixed. And it came through that we're ready to go. And we thought, well, okay. There was like a second. And it wasn't like a Tom Cruise Mission Impossible sort of cinematic pause for effect second. You know, this is a, a real-life thing that if we said fire, then 2-9 would have unleashed hell onto this company strength of, of guides. At that particular point in time, there was a, a clearing in the clouds and a, a scout flew from where we'd seen all this helicopter and, and their troop, you know, and then it was like, check fire. And, uh, and then Boswell saying, check fire to the gunnery officer at brigade. And I tell you, that one second, if that cloud hadn't cleared and if that chopper had not got through that, Clouds, it would have been devastating. You know, already the Welsh Guard had sort of uh, it, its own issues with, with the with the ship being hit, etc. For the following two minutes where we were, you could have cut the tension with with a knife, and you would have heard a pin drop. I mean, very closely. I mean, and you can imagine the consequences. It's quite yeah, literally a fog of war, wasn't it? Well, I'd say, and of course, what it was, it was five brigade coming up. And dropping its its guys off, but they hadn't communicated mm. to, to anybody. Uh, you, you know, you talk about sort of controlling your anger, and you're thinking one second away, those guys will not, will never have realised that they were one second away from being totally decimated. And then the guys that were on Mount Challenger, they had a fire mission, and um, and by this time, the gunnery officer was getting concerned because ammunition of 105s were getting getting short, and that team. I radioed in that uh, there was a, a gang of Argentines queuing for breakfast, and um, and then asked for a fire mission. You know, and eventually it was was given, and then they put down this uh, this fire mission and um, took the breakfast queue out. So you know that that was that job done, and then the team that uh, did the joint insert with their speed did a twenty five k on a Bridget Raider, and when both teams got out. The ML team went one way and SB went and, and did their stuff. And that was Kiwi Hunt. And it was Kiwi then and got caught in a blue on blue with Hereford because they didn't know that it was there. So that was uh, really, really sort of um, 
uh, he, he had a lot of people that, for all the reasons, we'd, we'd down to South Georgia, we'd had our scene with West Falklands and, and the beach. You know, we'd just done Smoko Mountain, we were, where we nearly took out, you know, a company of, of Welsh guards, wherever they were uh, at, at that particular point, to hear that Kiwi had gone, and, and we'd all knew Kiwi, because the call was a much smaller place then. There was quite a few Blue on Blues, from my recall, though. I think... Uh... One of the para battalions, they had a blue on blue within the battalion, and mm. again, just that whole, you know, what they refer to as the fog of war. It's a sadly, it's a fact of life. It happens in it happens in Afghanistan. It's happened in Iraq, mm. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be be so alert, you know, to it, and because I mean, everything that we did on Smoker was was fine, and uh, had it happened, no doubt at the subsequent board of inquiry that you would have been dragged to. What did you do in anything else? And they would say, yeah, fog of war, that, that's it. And like now we live in a 24-7, 365 communication society and it's just about communicating. And I think that's what irritated people about uh, about Hereford's contribution at that time is that this absolute intransigence just to talk, don't care what guns you got, no, don't care how you do your job, it's the team game. So I think that's, that's where I sort of irritated those guys came back from that patrol. So we're talking about the 4th of June now. And what was interesting around about the 4th of June, the, the CO of 4-2, uh, no, role of 4-5 then, actually had requested one of the Carter teams to uh, go and patrol around a thing called Wall Mountain. And he asked for a couple of teams to do that. So what was interesting now is that the, the Carter's confidence, if you like, in the Carter's contribution was now growing amongst the you know the senior commanders. So two teams went out and did that. And on the 8th and 9th of June, and this is the bit that I think was uh, surpasses the, the top Marlow, was that um, was all summoned by Brigade HQ, by the, the IT officer, because the areas north of Mount Harriet and south of Two Sisters and north of Mount Tumbledown was very vague in terms of the commanders of, of four two, especially in four five in their planning for that for those features. There was no typical sort of aerial photographs that you'd get, you know, of our time in Ireland at the time. So two Carter teams were committed to join a fighting patrol from K Company and then to get to a point near the west end of Goat Ridge where they jump off and K Company then uh, troop would go towards the uh, Mount Harriet and engage the Argentines. Now, what was quite amusing is that the, the two Carter teams have jumped off, gone to ground. The troop from K Company has gone forward and started putting some fire down to show there were some harassing fighting patrols out. The return fired by the Argies were going over the heads of the of the K Company lads, but it was falling around the Carter teams. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't fly back. They were a bit gutted. You know, the K Company moved on and went back to their own base. So the two Carter teams, they split. One went up the north side of Goat Ridge and the, the other the, the south side to check the full length of Goat Ridge. And then in the early hours of uh, of that, the nights there, they uh, confirmed the enemy positions that they'd seen on, on Harriet and Two Sisters. The Argentine forces there were, were in much greater strength than hitherto had been envisaged by the brigade sort of uh, staff. And therefore, the patrols remained in situ throughout the day of the 9th, which meant that when they went in on the on the evening of the 8th, should I say, and they got to their respective uh, positions, they were then committed to that because they had to stay throughout the whole of the daylight hours on the 9th. So, you know, zero movement, zero eating and everything else. You know, they could hear the Argentines. They got within five metres of the Argentine positions. The two team leaders then had done detailed sketches of the respective enemy positions. And something that's not uh, widely known or, or sort of mentioned really, that, and this also included a large command wire bomb that the Argentines had put out and, and the barrels buried in the ground on the south side of Two Sisters and the, and the command wire leading out to the trench. So when the guys then came back the evening of the of the ninth, um, the two team leaders then went to the respective commanding officers of four five and four two to to give them 
the brief, that intelligence was quite critical to those COs in the formulation of their plans for, for, for the night assaults. And I think that patrol, I think, encapsulated the real merits of the reconnaissance leaders, the intelligence and the surveillance that, uh, you know, the skill set. I think that patrol does more to honour the uh, the training and everything else as opposed to Top Marlow, which was just a traditional sort of ambush, bang, that's it. Whilst as successful as that was, I think the fact that two senior NCOs of a GDSQ, General Duties SQ, then go back to the commanding officers, that information that the commanding officers had trust of, of the yeah. information uh, that allowed them then to, to go out and do that. Plus also finding that IED, I mean, that was an exceptional piece of work. In fact, Des Wasser is no longer with us. He went on to become a, a very successful law sim. He, he got the MM for that, and, and quite rightly so. And that, that got us to the to the 14th of June, then where the, the big attacks happened by, by all the respective units. As you just sort of said there, Nige, if you summarise it then, you, you got to see from your discussion we've had with you there, the full broad spectrum of skills demonstrated by the CADA. You know, you had the sitting in the OPs, the going forward and doing recce's, the ability to call in fire from guns, uh, acting as guides for a, a rifle company. It's a fair remit of skills there and some very complicated and difficult ones as well. I think really, f- we'll finish off this part of the pod with a quote from Major General Julian Thompson who said that the cadre that I knew in the Falklands set standards of excellence in soldiering skills that were never bettered by anyone, including the SES and the SBS. This professionalism included never making map reading errors, the skillful use of ground, excellent tactics and engagements, dexterity in calling for and adjusting supporting fire, and the ingenious sighting of OPs close to the enemy. The card performed these and other tasks without hubris of the kind that led others to near and sometimes actual disaster through ignoring advice or as a result of incompetence or second-rate soldiering. That was used then as a jumping-off point for the card because post-war they built on that fall and success. So my next question is really in three parts. It's, it's firstly, how did you get to become the card CSM and then the 1st Brigade Patrol Troop CSM? And the CADA's transition to the Brigade Recce in the Falklands was difficult. So how did you start the Brigade Patrol Troop? And how did this impact mountain leader training? If you want me to break them down one by one now, it just gives a shout. So, uh, When it all finished at uh, the Falklands, we actually got into Stanley and then we uh, got ourselves into the Malvinas Guest House, which is quite coincidental, which is now the Malvinas Hotel. And I've uh, arranged a dinner in the Marvins Hotel in September of this year when 13 of us go back there. Anyway, we got back to the UK. And as soon as we, we got back, I'm like, I'm one of the, the units, is that we were still an ML1's course, an ML2's course, two ML2's courses and got of staff. We got back to the UK and then everybody just went their separate ways. And um, we actually never sort of said a formal sort of goodbye to one another apart from the social occasions on the, on the ship coming back because we went to the Ascension and then we flew back from, from Ascension to Brides. So my career then very quickly went to, uh, I got promoted to Sergeant as soon as I, I got back and I was going to uh, 40 Commando uh, where I then had best job in the best two years of my time in the Corps as a troop sergeant, and I had nine troop Charlie Company, and they were 40 Commando. And our 40 Commando, coincidentally, out on Falklands was held as, as much in reserve, and that frustrated them because they couldn't do that. Apart from nine troop, they were tasked to get up to Sapper Hill. They got on to seeking what well, they call pingers that, that look after submarines, so... Their pilots are probably not as au fait of navigating over the terrain as they would do the sea where they're just flying on, on instruments. But they actually landed on a, a live LS. So as the chops were landed on, troop was actually being being in contact. I had two guys shot. One was shot in the arm and a big broad jock got shot in the head. But I think he just saw it as a, as a Glasgow kiss. Because <laughs> when I worked with him, he, he, seemed, he seemed perfectly well. But I had two years of these guys and, uh, and, and it was great and we... 
and when we got back, 40 Commando then was seeing barracks in Plymouth. We then immediately, I think, through September, had a med deployment, and then they moved out of that barracks while we were away and then moved into Norton Man- Manor Camp in Taunton, where they are now. We got back. I did a South Armagh trip with these guys, and then when I finished that, I then uh, went back to the Cardiff, 84, 86, 86 to 89, I was uh, I was in the three-star headquarters up at the Commandant General and the MOD as the Assistant Royal Marines Public Relations Officer. At that time, being just a sort of Sergeant ML1, he gave me exposure of the institution of the Ministry of Defence sort of worked and anything else. And I have to say, I nearly left the Corps at that time because it was it was a circus and uh, to see how it sort of worked, I was unimpressed. Really, there was some quality that was there, but, you know, the infighting and, and everything else, it was an eye-opener. But that came and went. I then did a period of time as a unit ML for for four two commando. I got promoted warrant officer and did my first job down at HQ Company down in Paul. There was always competition for roles, but then I was uh, selected then to be the, the Carter Sergeant Major. So I went down to back to the Carter in 91, so at 92, the Brigade Patrol Troop uh, evolved. So up to 92, was the Carter still wearing two hats? It was still earmarked as doing all the training side for the MLs. And was it also still earmarked for the Brigade Ricky Force as well? No, it took 10 years uh, for that. I mean, the Carter was still being used at the end of the, of the NATO exercises in that advanced force role. But uh, there was nothing formally sort of happening until that point where it then becomes Brigade Patrol. Right, okay. And, yeah. and it, it happened very, very quickly. Sort of the boss came in one day, he said, we need to have a chat. So we're, we're now going to become the Brigade Patrol Troop, uh, go and get some Marines in. And it was all done on, on the hoof. So I'd, I'd sent two seniors around the three units because we needed to get 12 Marines in. And, and, of course, the units weren't that enamoured of us sort of coming in and nicking talent you know from a selfish point of view I'd, I'd want the marine hopefully at least paratrained if you had a snipers thing under his belt that would be great so it just save mm-hmm. us a bit more work because i could see how condensed the program would be in, the, in those initial days so we got the 12 marines in and of course then it was at, at what point of the year were we going to create uh this sort of new unit as the brigade patrol troop the ML training itself would carry on the sort of normal, really. That wasn't so much of a pain. But we then said, well, if we bring the Marines in in September, and because we're at, we're at Stonehouse Barracks uh, there in Plymouth, we're actually right beside our own sort of headquarters. So from a Sergeant Major's point of view, I had, had all of the regimental issues that were of a concern. So we then decided that we would get the people in and we would then take them straight out to the Alps because there was no selection as such. I mean, it was just interviews to get the Marines in. We could then start the physical training and and the sort of induction as to what it is. And, of course, it was always going to be a challenge because, you know, every time we went away, we would always have an all-ranks bar. We weren't really too worried about the the rank structure. That self-respect and self-discipline was always there. But, of course, we were bringing young Marines into this culture and of course, they were just young lads, like like we've all been young lads. So you know, they're developing as individuals, etc. So that that was always going to be a challenge. And from the sergeant major's point of view, and from the you know regimental aspect of what you needed to do, you know, there was some <laughs> there was definitely some bumps in the road that we, <laughs> we we had to navigate. We got them, and and what that meant then was that the troop could sort of boast in you know, a six four man patrols, and we had an ML. As its team leader, we had a sniper and we had two sort of M or two core balls. And as it quickly developed, we then sort of brought in two nine commando in terms of what we learned from, from the Falklands and then and then the engineers and then Y Troop, which was our specialist signals unit that we had, and the shore reconnaissance team from five three nine. So very, very quickly this this base started to sort of grow. And the vision of what was required by brigade was, you know, started to sort of happen. These engineers, sappers and the gunners you're bringing in, did they form a 
part of the permanent nucleus, or were they just brought in to help you with training? At that stage, they were probably more attached. I mean, now that they are permanently attached within what is now SRS. But because they were quite small, we we knew them, and it was always the same sort of guys. So that there was no sort of new bridge building. And and I have to say is that the two four command at RE as there were there used to be old five nine etc. And the two nine lads. I mean, we'd all work together, so we were all the same. So it was. Yeah, that was very, very easy sort of, you know, to put together. But what was interesting is that the it was a much more structured thinking by brigade. As that evolved, we had then over 2004, 2005, the ML training actually decouples from the brigade patrol troop itself and goes back to where it probably started from was the commando training centre. So all the Royal Marines then is, is done from... ML training is done from the from the Royal Marines Training Centre. But as things evolved, and you talked about the future commando force, and of course then they created what they call I-Star Company, which is the Intelligence Surveillance Target Acquisition and Reconnaissance. And ML training is ML Company under the I-Star Company there. So they start to focus in these core elements. So what's very, very good about the Royal Reeds and where they've continued to, to get very polished is that there's a, there's a method in that process and that planning. And by 2007, they'd really sort of get into this as, as a training component of the ML training, of the, um, all of these aspects, and it, and it gets a focus. And then in 2010, the 30 Commando Information Exploitation Group is created, and this is a, a kickback from the from the Second World War. The focus there was focusing in, as I understand it, after my time, is that the, the focus sort of 90 days ahead of the battle force. And then in 10, 2012, the BBT sort of evolves again. When we started this tour, went from cliff leaders to recce leaders to, you know, to mountain leaders. So now we're, we're staying with the mountain leaders that are the spine of the organisation. And when Bosel took over, you know, it was 17 strong. And the SRS now is 103 strong. Two troops, they've got six four-man teams of mountain leader and snipers in there. They've got three six-man shore recce teams, boat teams. So they will deploy in submarine, off submarines and whatever it is to, to get in. They've got three five-man teams from... 148 battery, so the three six man engineer teams from 24 recce unit, and they got a nine man sort of you know, signals and digital unit. It has grown exponentially. And back in, I think, 2012, what they then did is that they created a classification. And when I started this journey with you this evening, is that we said a Marine does a, a, a three specialization, then a corporal would do a twos and the sergeant would do a ones. Well, then the, the Marines then, as part of this methodology, brought in the uh, the mountain leader class three or RL three, where the Marines then came in and did an eight week course. And then once they'd done that course uh, under, the, under the ML training, they would then go back to their recce troops. You now have a, a complete sort of cradle to grave process, uh, if you like. A, a Marine then, if he wants to go down this pathway, then applies for RL training, his recce leader training. You know, goes into a, a unit recce troop. If he then decides that he wants to go in ML, he comes down his ML's L's training. And then eventually, then, if he wants to, I suspect, you know, he gets into SRS. And from there, then, they have a pathway in which then they can go to special forces. I think now is at 65%, as I'm told, you know, of today's badge special forces, be that the SAS or the SBS, come from the Royal Marines. And when you view the, the Falklands, where it really just crystallised, you know, the vision of Rob Boswell, that it was the proof of concept, and where they've now got this future commando force, is that they've gone through a very logical pathway in order to get to the point of where they are and, and where they'll be in another 25, 30 years, God only knows. It's in very good hands at the moment, I have to say. It's very impressive. I, I didn't realise the range of skills that the SRS had, and to explain them, they're, they're a very potent force, and you got to think that they're sort of in the cusp of the skills in a Tier 1 Special Forces unit, when you think about it, that's what they can bring to the battle space. 
I think it's there. I think it's that the Marines are very good in just in keeping it down. I mean, they they are just general duties that it's a career path that they can do within the Royal Marines. If if they've got a niche they need to stretch and go down the S, the SF route, then it's now clearly open. I mean, in my day, if they, because the SBS at that stage were not seen to be special forces. You had the odd Marine that had to leave the Marines to join an Army TA unit just to go and do Hereford selection and then get into to Hereford that way. They had to leave, but now they've that, that got this uh, joint training. You know, they get to the end of that, and if they go to the Frog Squad, as we would call it, the, the SB, then they'll go to Paul and do the additional diver training and whatever else, else they need to do. So I think that the skill sets that they've got are commensurate with that. And now from an SF point of view, if you've got someone that passes their training, you know, the SF selection that comes in, I imagine the competition is quite fierce internally. It's saying, well, we'll grab him because he's come through that. Mm. We know that what that skill set is. We don't have to train it to get it to that to that level. It's, mm. it, it's proven. The capabilities they, they've got, the flexibility that it, that it offers the brigade and what the brigade then can offer. Highly capable, extremely well trained, fit, strong lads. It's impressive. They give a any senior sort of two or three star command gap. Yeah. Huge opportunities. I read Rod Boswell's book, sort of about a month ago, I think it was. What struck me about Rod was he's obviously a, a, a man who's determined, a man who knew what he wanted to do and had a vision of how he wanted to do that. He'd obviously, as you've alluded to earlier on, nice those Royal Marine connections you talked about, he knew he had to do the diplomacy piece with to, in order to get his vision over the line. But do you think history has treated Rod Boswell with due respect? And has he got the recognition that perhaps he deserves? Good question. Yeah, Rod was definitely a strong-minded guy. Has it treated him well? I think... Others of less contribution have got a lot more. I think his legacy, he should be proud of his legacy. I mean, when he started with his vision, I mean, he inherited 17 guys, which included a storm and, and a driver. He knew where he, he wanted to go. And he set in motion a process that now when I visited SRS, that's gone from 17 strong to 103 strong. And as you have generously suggested, that uh, you know that the, the skill sets and the qualities there are, are, are very impressive, and I think he should be very proud of what he achieved because I know those that work with him are very proud of him and what he's done because the where they are now, you have to start somewhere, and he, he, with his vision and and obviously then General Thompson's and of course the successes that we were able to to demonstrate uh, in the Falklands. Uh, and as I said, I'll go back to that Goat Ridge recce, which I think was uh, really sort of put the cherry on the cake of the skill sets. He would depart this earth having having left a mark in the sand. And I said, I don't think many people do that. And uh, and I think those that, that work with him and know him and his successors are equally of, of respectful of, of what he did. And so I think he, he should be he should be pleased. And I think his book was long overdue. He was probably, you know, too self-deprecating to, to put it out there. It gave me a great career. And seeing people that uh, when I was the Carter Sergeant Major or the BPT Sergeant Major, I met a couple at the at the SRS reunion that we had. And Mick McCarthy, he went down to Hereford, was a successful SAS Staff Sergeant. Several of the lads became RSMs, quality is out. He's the guy that, uh, that gave it direction. He gave it form and function. He should be very proud. You know, the Marines are appallingly bad in giving honours and awards out, you know, but we, we all felt that he was shortchanged. We, we think he was he was worthy of an MC for, for Top Marlow, but, you know, that never came out. So that's, that's just the way it goes at Sergeant Green Suit, isn't it? Well, thanks, Nigel, for that. And uh, as usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dates, which is the guest choice of book, film, and luxury item. So, Nigel, for this episode, what have you chosen? Well, I thought about this long and hard, and I thought, well, I, I like books that are a work of fiction that uh, that focus on things that have actually happened. And I was thinking, well, 
you could have three lads in the, down the pub having having a beer, you know, and a, an Irishman, an Englishman, and a Norwegian. And the Irishman can say his name would be Tom Cree. Could say, you know, I was on Glock's expedition. It got quite rough, and uh, I had to do a solo walk across the, you know, the ice floe to to save an otter, and I had to sort of fifty six k. And the Englishman could be Joe Simpson of uh, of touching the void. When in eighty five, it was it was climbing the Sula Grand in the Peruvian Andes. Jesus, Tom, he said, uh, I was climbing in the Andes, and I uh, got up this. Climb that's never been climbed before, and as I was coming down, I broke my leg, and, and my mate cut the rope, and then I fell down through a crevasse, and then I would crawl 8k over three days to get back to base. And the Norwegian would be a guy called Jan Bolstroyd, and he would say, "Lads, hold my beer." Now Jan Bolstroyd was a book character that Astrid Kirsten or Carlson Scott produced on the, on the Twelfth Man, and it's a true story of. Bolstroy, when he was worked for the Ling Group in uh, the early 40s in, in Norway, got to the UK via Russia and America to do his sort of SOE training up in Scotland with the commandos there. They got about 100 kilogram explosives and the, their task was to get back to Norway and blow up the con- control tower at Barda Force Airport. And they made the transit back into Norway, but then after a few days they were doing an in sort of coastal waters sort of transit and they got bumped by the Germans and for, and for Bolstroyd I mean he, he had to sort of jump ship he was caught in an avalanche and buried up to his neck he went in the snowstorm for three days he was entombed alive in snow for another four days he was abandoned under open, open skies for five more alone for two weeks in a cave he used a knife to amputate several of his own frostbitten toes to stop the spread of gangrene. He spent the last 27 days tied to a stretcher near death as teams of Norwegian villagers dragged him across to the semi-tribe in, in Finland to get him to the safety of Sweden. And Jan Bolstroyd, if ever a book was to epitomise the strength of character that you need to operate in cold conditions... And uh, this is the one. And Astrid Carlson Scott's is the second edition of the book, and she's since passed on. It's called The Twelfth Man, but the in-depth research she's done, and if you just follow this guy, I mean, this is in February. So he has to dive off the ship, swim ashore. I think he gets shot in the foot. He slots a German. He knows he's got to go back into the field to swim to another island. So his ability to survive was absolutely phenomenal and that's a great read for anybody so that's my book well i need to have a look at that and that's the first time i've heard of that but you've inspired me to go and have a look now it's film choice night ah uh, it's gonna be heroes of ten in my ah, that's not a surprise for a marine <laughs> <laughs> again it was just a classic commando raid yeah. my brave norwegians parachuting into the hardanger vida you know getting in there and doing it yeah just a phenomenal story and uh the work that the SRS do of today will be no different from, from what they were doing back then. It's yeah. just a phenomenal film. I think you alluded to earlier that the, the kit and equipment changes, but the basic skills yeah. and mindset required to operate in the Arctic is never going to change, is it? That doesn't change at all. You know, And I think you mentioned it earlier on. It's, it, it, again, it's, it takes a particular skill set to be very good at the very basics. Yeah. And that look gear kit, you know, and however tired you are, and that takes a special type of sort of mindset and, and human, that's why not everybody does jobs like MLs or SB mm. or SAS, because you're just looking for that that sort of top 10% quality that not everybody sort of can dig deep for, so that makes a difference, and that's why when you look, you know, not everybody's a you know eight foot tall and, and everything else, it's, uh, it comes in all shapes and sizes. And we've seen that in, with women in, in Second World War and the SOE. So, yeah, it's amazing. And your luxury item? Uh, I'll be a good quality jacket. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it, it will take you anywhere. doesn't matter where, where you're stuck. So I always have uh, a selection of good quality now. And because Gore-Tex and Windproofs and everything else, it's uh, all every, every time a good, a good jacket. Carly? Well, my choice is not going to surprise him because I've referred to it several times during the podcast. It's Mountain Commanders at War on the Falklands by Rod Boswell. 
And I think we've already covered what an inspirational person Rod is. A man with vision, a man with good diplomatic skills, and somebody with the forthrightness to anticipate a new role. And I think that's a lot of units, whether it's army, the marines, they stay in a role, and if they get the need to evolve, they need to make themselves relevant. The Marines, as a force, has done that, and we've already said the Army yeah, hasn't. Definitely. It doesn't. Army doesn't know what it wants to do. It's, a, it's quite a slim volume, but there's a lot of revealing stuff in it. He's again, he's a type of character. There's no whole bars. He's very critical about the, especially our services. We've already discussed, and uh, he just talks about his vision at the start, how it changed what the card did during the, the Falklands War and what it meant to them after it. And I'd really recommend it as a, a really interesting read for people. So what's your book then, Kev? My, my book is called Mission France, and it's about the um, SOE, but it's mainly around the, the, the females of SOE. And I didn't realise there was 39 females that um, operated in France as part of the SOE. There's over 400 operators uh, across Europe. 39 females in France. And this book is basically talking about their recruitment, their training, obviously going up to Scotland, doing the commander course. For some of them, doing the parachute course as well, because some of them are parachuted in. Some of them are by boat, some of them are by um, um, airplane. And obviously this is all started from when Winston Churchill was pushing for commandos pushing for ESOE to go into Europe, set Europe ablaze. It was formed in 1940, and as I mentioned, it was 39 female agents that went to France. Some of them were captured, interrogated, some escaped, some were executed. And I was just surprised by the amount of awards that those 39, and this is not including the, the other ladies that went to other parts of Europe and other operations for SOE, but from the 39, three were awarded the GC, two were awarded the George Medal, 18 MBEs, an OBE, and 22 Grosse de Guerre, which is the equivalent to the Military Medal or Military Cross for the French. And one of them, a lady called Virginia Hall, she only had one leg. She had the prosthetic leg. And she operated as part of the SOE until she was compromised and she escaped. There's a big story about that got back to UK, and the SOE couldn't use her anymore. They said she'd be compromised. But because she was American, she joined the OSS and then deployed with them and was um, awarded Distinguished Service Cross as well as uh, an MBE for her service during the war. Uh, and what was, uh, what was strange was I wondered why they got GCs and such like. But because they were females, they weren't allowed to serve in combat, so they weren't allowed to have the equivalent gallantry. So had the civilian awards as a civilian award. military awards. Yeah. It's barking mad, isn't it? Well, it was a different time, wasn't it? And no one ever thought about this sort of stuff. It, it was different times, and, and I think that's where society is getting itself in the nick of, in the nick of the twist now. But it is different times, you know, but the you know the bravery of those women. Unbelievable. Uh, very, very great. I mean, there's, there's a couple of films out with that. From, obviously, Virginia mm -hmm. McKenna did... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, one and there was uh, Odette, I think, was the other one. But the stories of, I mean, the SOE stories, and as a nation, we had to club this group of people, unusual people, train them up, and then throw them into Europe and hope that they could, just, you know, work with the resistance, disrupt as much as they could the Germans, while we were, where we were still rebuilding our armies and forces from Dunkirk and other such things. And at the same time, there was those odd commando raids going on yeah. uh, just to keep reminding the Germans that we were still in the fight. A lot of these women, does it cover how they're recruited? Because some of the recruitment processes are quite funny. They're like yeah, recommended yeah. and yeah. then they put some competitions in newspapers that the well, women I think, won. I think that was mainly Bletchley Park. Oh, that, that actually part was it? But these were all part of the fannies, as it was, if you remember the the nursing yeomanry um, and the, and other support roles. But a lot of them, because they were either they had French nationality or they spoke French or had lived in France, and I think this is exactly the same for the the male operators as well. Um, a lot of them recruited, you know, they had a skill set or something unusual, or they'd lived there, or they could speak the language. 
mm. and a lot of these went out as couriers and uh, radio operators. So yeah, I met a lady who did that uh, when I was uh, I was in London in '95. Yeah, and we went to a uh, Chelsea Barracks. I think at the time was DSF. I think the yeah, special yeah, yeah. were yeah. based there. And we were having a few drinks, and I was there with a mate from Hereford. And they were having a little get together, and this talked to this little old lady about 70 yeah, yeah. and chatting away to her. She never told me a thing. And then when I left, my mate said to me, She was an SOE during the war. Yeah. That's why they obviously they incorporated using women into the SOE as well. Because the Germans are just like us. We were always looking for the male spy, the male agent, and the females were able to get away with a lot more. That's happened. But uh, fascinating. I mean, the SOE story is fascinating anyway. But it's definitely worth, I'm, I'm reading this book at the moment, so it's definitely worth people to get a hold of and have a read. Yeah, I'll give that a go. Right. Well, Nigel, thanks for coming to the podcast, mate. Much appreciated. And that's it for another episode. So thanks to Nigel for coming on. And to you, the listener, for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us in all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've downloaded from iTunes or anywhere else and you've liked the pod, give us a review and help spread the news out there. And finally, thanks again to Nick Beale for his continuing support and sponsorship to this series and offering technical support through his company ISR. And we'll see you next time on the Unconventional Soldier. Soldier.